everybody and welcome to the Rupa Subramania show. I am of course Rupa Subramania. I hope uh, you're all doing well wherever you're tuning in from. My guest today is Matt Strauss, who's a critical care physician and acting medical officer for Haldeman Norfolk. Dr. Strauss has been critical of um, excessive uh, government um, uh, pandemic measures such as lockdowns and mass mandates and recently, sections of the mainstream media have tried to um, discredit and cancel him. Uh, most recently, an article in the Toronto Star uh, caricatured and ridiculed some of his comments. His health district, however, has seen a 30% lower mortality from COVID than the provincial average. So I guess in a sense, he feels vindicated and he's stepping down from his position. To talk about all of this and more, please welcome Dr. Strauss to the show. Matt, welcome to my show. Welcome to the Rupa Subramania show. I uh, really applaud your courage uh, in being uh, one of the few brave voices uh, in the Ontario healthcare system. Uh, uh, you know, you've had the courage to criticize uh, some of these draconian uh, and harsh uh, measures uh, from the government. Um, first, you know, can we can we start by you describing to us uh, what you do as a critical care physician? What What is it that you've seen during the pandemic as a critical care physician? Uh, okay, so um, critical care doctors or ICU doctors, It uh, you go to med school for four years, mm -hmm. you do a background specialty, uh, either internal medicine, anesthesia, surgery, or emergency medicine uh, for three to five years. And then you do uh, two years of a subspecialty in critical care medicine. And the... Um, some of the things that define critical care medicine are um, very invasive uh, medications that we give through the the, the main lines uh, main lines that we put in your jugular vein, and also mm -hmm. the breathing machine, so life support. Um, it might be fair to say that critical care doctors are, are life support specialists. That's a, that's a huge part of what we do. Um, and I have been practicing uh, as a critical care doctor for ten years. I. I was the chief of my critical care unit in, uh, at a community hospital in Ontario. Um, I, uh, for the last five years, I wouldn't say that I was burnt out. I, I was something like, uh, I felt like I'd, I was limited in terms of growth and that some, some things were bothering me um, about the sort of medicine I deliver. Um, and what I was seeing in my patients that I, I was putting the same person on a, on a breathing machine mm -hmm. three times in one year um, for lung disease from smoking, but they were still smoking or um, from overdose, but they, they were still being prescribed the medications that they were overdosing on or, or, um, uh, or uh, yeah. diabetics not taking their insulin, this sort of thing. Um, so I was concerned about these larger issues in population, public health, community health, um, and at the time, I went to I, I went to journalism school, and uh, I just finished a fellowship at the at Monk School in Journalism. Hmm. When the, and I'd written a couple pieces, one for the National Post, one for Vice News, um, and and that's when the pandemic broke out. So I, I kind of already had these background concerns about um, sometimes we're not doing what we wish we were, or we're not achieving what we wish we were achieving uh, in a, in our field. Um, when so, the pandemic. Sorry to quickly quickly interrupt. Why did you go to journalism school? You were already a doctor. I wanted to write about these things that um, oh, okay. I guess these these counterintuitive things I was seeing where yeah. um, it's, okay. it's really easy to pat yourself on the back all the time as a medical okay. specialist and being like I'm I'm saving the world, but it's like okay. you, you're you're not. There's these, there's these bigger issues in in public health that that um, I think have to do. The, the word holistic captures a lot mm -hmm. of it. That that health okay. is so, so much more than the absence of disease. Health is, do you have someone you can call when you're in mm -hmm. uh, bad straits? Do you have, um, do you have adequate housing? These sorts of things are like, is your city walkable? Yeah. Um, and, and these are really public health concerns, uh, one might say now. Anyway, so I had just started writing and I had a, a couple clips in, in mainstream media, the pandemic broke out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd been on Twitter for like 10 years. Um, and at one point, I think in April, 2020, I, I uh, two, Actually, two things happened around the same time. I, I on, on March 26th, I, I tried to get a piece published about my concerns about lockdown, that it was going to harm all these other things about health and population health. If if your if your faith group isn't meeting, if if grandparents can't see their grandchildren, if you if you don't have a good job, like this is all going to cause more disease and critical illness. Um, and we're we're just being a bit short-sighted in terms of the two weeks to flatten the curve canard. 
Um, so I wrote this piece. I, I had read every paper on COVID, uh, like swear to God at, at that time, mm-hmm. there weren't that many papers on COVID. There's now 700,000 papers on COVID. Um, so I felt like I, I, I understood the medicine really well. I had this, this honest concern about what we were doing to our society and no media in Canada would publish that piece period, full stop. I sent it everywhere. Um, people, editors who had printed my last pieces suddenly stopped returning my emails. Mm. Um, and um, what, when, when was this in the pandemic? Uh, March, 2020. So like oh, two weeks okay. after the first lockdown, okay. I, I think. Wow. Yeah. So it was like March 20th that I wrote this piece and I felt obsessed about it. I was like, I, I, I got to get this out. Um, and one Canadian editor of an international publication who I view as something as a mentor, uh, accepted my piece for international publication. And the next day said, sorry, my, my boss, um, like, you know, so what might say the publisher says, absolutely not. Um, mm-hmm. But I'll have you on my podcast. But then he called back and said, no, I can't even have you on the podcast. I'm sorry. But he sent it to an editor at The Spectator uh, in, in the UK, which blew my mind as, as somebody who just yeah. started writing a couple pieces to get into Spectator. It was amazing. Mm. So I was writing for Spectator. I, I, I couldn't believe my luck. Um, and I, I had a couple tweets that went insanely viral, um, like 25,000 likes in, in a week, uh, one of which where I just said, hey, my, my ICU is actually empty. It's never been this empty before. Uh, we have 13 beds. We only have two people in our ICU seems like we flattened the curve. Like maybe we should start liberalizing things. I think it was a very banal statement, but then suddenly Ben Shapiro was retweeting it. And I was like, what is going on? And with that attention, or I guess you might say journalistic success, um, came a lot of criticism of me. Um, And I basically from day one in that spring of 2020, I, um, I, I was criticized by colleagues. I was criticized by administrators. There were some back and forth, a bunch of meetings I had to go to, some emails. And at the end of the day, I was like, look, I, I, I'm the most kind of doctrinaire, evidence-based doctor. People were getting really excited about ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. And I, w- I was not excited about those things. I'm, I'm really a dyed-in-the-wool skeptic. I, I want to mm-hmm. see the International Multicenter Randomized Control Trial in a peer-reviewed paper, uh, journal before I get very excited about things. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly I was being painted as on oh. the fringe because I wasn't um, applauding these very draconian measures. So I, I, for about six months, I was just engaged in the, this criticism and concern about lockdowns. Um, in yeah. November 2020, the university administration, the university I was affiliated with, started giving me a very hard time. And I, I made some noise about, hey, hey look, mm-hmm. like if, if you go to the main webpage, uh, academic freedom is, is supposed to exist here. Um, like, please stop sending me these things. Um, yeah. And so that got turned up more and more as time went on. And then I became more and more alarmed because in yeah. December of 2020, we were suddenly um, plunged into another lockdown in Ontario, which was, yeah, it was unbelievable to me. I, I, I could not believe it. Um, and uh, it, it felt like I had done all this public commentary and critique had been in good faith. I'd, I'd been referencing the medical literature. I'd, mm-hmm. um, I described some, some I, I was seeing firsthand things that were also reflected in the medical literature. So I was seeing more people dying of, of uh, substance abuse and uh, overdose. Yeah. We, we now know, I think it was published in JAMA, in Ontario, uh, overdose deaths in young men quadrupled during spring 2020, um, which is horrendous and tragic and then and the first hand mm-hmm. I was seeing elders from nursing homes who were starving to death because their families weren't allowed to come in and feed them which they had been depending on yeah um so I I, I always felt like I'm just honestly describing what I'm seeing I'm honestly referencing the medical literature I honestly kind of am an expert in this stuff um and I'm I'm not going to stop talking about it but it seems like it's, it's having no effect then in spring 2021 Ontario did an even more draconian lockdown where they were going to have the police stop you a block from your house to ask, mm. what are you doing out? Mm-hmm. And it was the chiefs of police in Ontario who said, no, we're, we're not doing that. This is police state stuff. The premier, to his credit, apologized, I think, the next day. But if you look at any civics textbook anywhere in the Western world, the chiefs of police are not supposed to be the guardians of civil liberty. Like if that's mm. your, um, if, if, that, that, if that's who's protecting civil liberties in your country or your province, that's a big problem. So I, I frankly, began to despair of it. I, I was like, I, I thought I had, 
I thought I'd done everything I could do in terms of public speaking and commentary and writing to just stop this tragedy unfolding. Um, and I, I, I was sort of out of moves and then quite out of the blue, some members of this community in, in rural Ontario on, on the uh, kind of cottage country uh, farming community on, on the shores of Lake Erie um, asked me if I would apply to the job to the job to be their um, public health official. So I took that job. Yeah. Uh, and when my appointment was announced, like all hell broke loose. The, I, the Toronto Star, the CBC um, ran hit pieces on me yeah. um, that included just straight misinformation. Um, I'm, I'm not a litigious person, but I, I did mm -hmm. have to get a lawyer and that lawyer sent cease and desist letters to them. And, and we received a number of corrections and, and some apologies. Um, and then I, I just did my honest best to put the medical literature and my clinical experience into practice. Um, so for a year and a half now, I, I've been the medical officer of health for Halden and Norfolk. And I did not extend vaccine mandates like many of my colleagues did. I did not extend mask mandates. Um, we did very little by way of school closures or um, we didn't do restaurant capacity restrictions in excess of what the province uh, was doing. And the proof is in the pudding. We have 30% uh, fewer COVID deaths in my yeah. community that I serve than provincially. So at I'm the end of the day, I, I feel like I proved my point in, in real life. Yep. Um, I'm not expecting any sort of victory parade, but um, hopefully the next time we have a pandemic, uh, we won't do these wrong-headed things that are not supported by the best medical literature. Yeah, no, I was uh, going to come to that, actually, because uh, you um, referring to your um, a recent op-ed in the National Post where you say that uh, your district, your health district, saw 30% lower COVID mortality than the provincial average. I, I, I mean, I do... Uh, hope you feel a sense of vindication. I think you do. Uh, but what what exactly did you do there that was different from the rest of the province? So I, I want to be really clear. I'm not taking credit for this 30% lower death rate. Um, the mainstream media, uh, the Toronto Star, the CBC, uh, uh, the Globe and Mail more insinuated it. But And, and some loud uh, kind of Twitter celebrities were saying mm -hmm. that I was going to kill people, the, the region was going to be on fire, the hospitals would be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was sure that wasn't going to happen. I think why is there 30% lower mortality in the region has to do mm -hmm. with what we talk about in public health, the social determinants of health. I think people are more connected there. There's more compassion. There's, um, uh, there, there's frankly more common sense. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you know, some of the things that I maybe can take credit for i i was passionate about getting vulnerable people vaccinated and and not coercing um young healthy people into mm -hmm. getting vaccinated um and so i said hey i i, I want to build trust in public health if you don't feel that you have a physician you can talk to about whether you should get vaccinated or not uh, call my office i'll call you back and i had dozens of phone calls with um, yeah. folks who were vulnerable and and some of them after speaking with me did decide to go get vaccinated perhaps yeah. that affected mortality rates. Um, there was, um, when Paxlovid came out, I, I was very impressed by the trial data. Like I said, I was not impressed by hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin. Mm -hmm. I thought this could be a game changer, but it wasn't available in my community. So I, I wrote a letter, the board of health in my community um, passed a motion supporting the letter. I gave the letter to the MPP, the MPP hand delivered it to the minister of health and they made Paxlovid available in our community. Um, and that maybe saved some lives. Mm -hmm. um, so there, uh, oh, and another thing was, uh, there's there a whole thing about monoclonal antibody, uh, mm. uh, monoclonal antibody therapy. Right. And we are very blessed um, to be close to McMaster in my community. And McMaster had an antibody monoclonal clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and the director of that clinic was like, I can't get anybody to show up. Like nobody's referring patients. It's almost, it, it, I think because of Trump derangement syndrome, people were like, no, it's, it's, there's no treatment. It's vaccinations and it's only vaccinations. We have to get everyone vaccinated. And it was like, no, there's, many things we can do. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I developed a procedure by which we would identify high-risk people in the community and get them referred to that clinic um, uh, right away. So, and, you know, I, I don't know, but hopefully that saves some lives too. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, no, that's uh, that's very interesting. I mean, I, I know I saw the attacks, um, um, you know, the attacks from sections of the mainstream media, some journalists. We'll come to that a little later. Uh, just a quick question. You know, you mentioned to me that uh, people in your community uh, 
actually wanted you to um, head head the public health unit in that district. Um, what that you know, I find that very interesting because at a time when you were saying um, something that was going against sort of the mainstream narrative, it was going against the grain of what was considered to be, uh, you know, the right thing to do at that time. Um, how is it that people in your community thought otherwise? And how, how is it that you were then, you know, you've, you eventually got to this position? How did that come about? Um, all I can say is a member of the community DM'd me on Twitter, had me call a number of other community leaders who were interested in what I had to say. I mm -hmm. think that just demographically, there are a lot of farmers in that community. Okay. Um, I think that a lot of what happened in terms of the nonsense that we saw, there, there was yeah. there was a few things. One is, if you live and work in the ivory tower in downtown Toronto and you create uh, sophisticated computer mathematical models to predict what's going to happen, you can publish papers all day long. You can go speak at conferences all day long, and it seems like nobody ever asks you if your models actually successfully mm. predict reality. But you can have yeah. a a sterling academic career based on these predictions that turn out to be false. Yeah. Um, and I think that in an agricultural community, you as a farmer, you can come up with a computer model about how you're going to grow more rutabagas that are bigger and more delicious than anyone else. Yeah. But you find out six months later if your theory holds water. And if you don't grow the rutabagas that you thought you're going to, you yeah. might lose the farm. Um, yeah. So I think, I think throughout the world it, when you when you go to these sort of rural agricultural places you're you're going to find a lot more common sense and a lot less um reliance on what uh what the the so-called experts of mainstream media uh, media think and you didn't face any kind of resistance from the bureaucracy i uh like like um um, the bureaucracy of these uh, healthcare units at all, like, oh, you know, this is Matt Strauss. He said all of these things about lockdowns and masks and, uh, you know, and I don't think he would be good for this position. You just didn't feel that kind of uh, resistance. I'm, when I was hired, yeah. um, uh, the the Board of Health, which is the, the body to which mm -hmm. I report, uh, voted nine to zero to hire me. Oh. Um, and, and everything that I had done was public. Yeah. When the media started yeah. raising hell, uh, it, you know, it was largely the downtown Toronto based media. Yeah. Um, there was a bit of mm, public outcry. I think that um, the, I, I heard one member of the Board of Health say they got like the same email 50 times, like a chain letter. And, and I think some of them were spooked. Um, so a, a meeting to reassess the hiring was oh. called. Okay. Um, I wrote them a letter saying, like, look, these these media reports are false. Mm -hmm. the, the corrections have been printed. Here's what I actually said and what I actually believe. Yeah. And then over that period of time, I understood they, they got um, hundreds of individuals in the community uh, calling their office saying, no, we, we uh, Amazing. The, the one the one board member who I think was concerned about the blowback initially said, we had hundreds of phone calls saying we, we don't want mandates, we want Dr. Strauss. Um, so there, there was a bit of like astroturfing yeah. online slacktivism to get rid of me. Yeah. Uh, in the end, they voted eight to one to keep. Well, I think that's a great story, actually. And it gives me some hope, uh, given that, you know, everybody was saying the same thing and you were saying something different. And, and then, you know, you headed this uh, healthcare unit. And, uh, and, you know, I think it's, you know, it gives me some hope and optimism that, uh, that there are sensible people out there and, uh, and that, uh, that we are capable of empowering uh, sensible people among us. And uh, so that, you know, that's, that's a great story, actually. Um, so, um, you know, Matt, I mean, could you tell me, uh, you know, we were, we've been, you know, you've opposed these draconian uh, measures. Um, you know, how do you, how would you assess the risk benefit trade off between, um, you know, between harsh measures such as lockdowns? I mean, did, in the end, did you, do you, do you think lockdowns saved lives? Did they, did they make any difference at all? So the, the best medical papers i have about 13 of them um there are uh, the 13 that i'm talking about looked at actual differences in population-wide mortality mm -hmm. so and we can do this ad hoc we can say we'll look at california versus florida florida was more liberal 
um, with age adjusted mortality for COVID, they had about the same outcomes. You can look at Brazil versus Argentina. Brazil was criticized because of Bolsonaro uh, took a more oddly liberal approach um, given his politics otherwise, whereas Argentina did uh, very strict lockdowns. And there's not much difference there either. You can look at Sweden versus the UK or Sweden versus Belgium. Um, all of these things. I, people like to compare Sweden versus Denmark, but Denmark also, or, or, or Sweden versus Norway, but all the Scandinavian countries actually had more liberal approaches in general. Mm. Um, so we can do that in, and we can be accused of cherry picking, but when researchers will, will take all of the US states or all of the countries in Europe or all the countries in the world and, and then do um, uh, multivariate logistic regression analysis. Yeah. And for those, 13 papers that I that I have, there's no difference um, based on how severe your um, measures were in terms of the, the body count at the end. So I'm, I'm very comfortable saying no on, on the large scale they didn't. I think that there's still the theoretic possibility that if, you're, if your hospitals are overwhelmed and you do lockdowns for two weeks and, and you make it instead of a, two weeks of being overwhelmed, four weeks of being just stressed, there might be a mortality benefit there. But ultimately, like the lock lockdowns can only work for as long as you do them. So it always mm. felt to me like we're building a bridge to nowhere. Every every case that you prevent with this lockdown, um, mm -hmm. you're just going to get when the lockdown is relieved. And that's what we saw in Ontario. Like the the vast majority of Ontarians ended up getting COVID despite all of the time we spent in lockdown. So it's it's a it's a delaying tactic. It doesn't change the game. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I just want to come to uh, this uh, question that, uh, you know, I, I, I refer to this uh, in uh, my recent National Post column, actually. Um, uh, it's not about lockdowns, it's about vaccines. And, um, and it was a Wall Street Journal uh, opinion column by a member of the editorial board uh, citing three different studies that point to how uh, viruses are actually adapting to the vaccines. Um, um, just as I suppose evolutionary biology would predict this, um, uh, and that's my layman's understanding of evolutionary biology, I wonder what you think about this. Are vaccines actually uh, abetting the rise of new variants? I think that um, I think that there were, were always going to be new variants, no matter what we do. If you have mm. a, if you have any organism and you're not eradicating it, you're, it's not on the endangered species list. It, mm -hmm. um, COVID will be with us forever. Um, COVID will continue to mutate forever. Um, if you uh, if you give a population of an organism a uh, an an evolutionary push in one direction, where you say, well, we're going to use this defense, the vaccines the virus will evolve around the vaccines. So there, there always were going to be variants. Um, what sorts of variants we see may in fact be responsive to what uh, mitigation measures we we use. Mm -hmm. I think that, and I just want to be very clear, I think that it's a bit of a modern miracle that a new disease came out and nine months later, we had a vaccination that saves lives. That's incredible. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I never want to take away from that mm -hmm. scientific achievement um, it seemed to me, but, and, and, and we're talking about evolutionary, evolutionary theoretical speculation. Okay. I, I like to talk about what the numbers show afterwards, but yeah, you, I would conjecture and I, and I did conjecture, I didn't like to tweet or write about it, that probably the best time to get COVID is, is three weeks after your vaccination. And if you get it five years from now, Hey, you'll be five years older. Um, and your vaccination might've worn off, but also it'll be a variant that is not the same as what you were just vaccinated for. So um, that's how I view it. Yeah, I mean, the last time I was vaccinated was more than a year ago. And uh, I probably, um, I, I mean, I, I suspect I had COVID at some point before the, the vaccines uh, were, uh, you know, were even available. I mean, I, I suppose I'm just basically more or less walking unprotected, but I'm also assuming I have these antibodies, right, from uh, from from having recovered from a COVID infection. Um, you know, so do you, do you think that everybody should get vaccinated? Or should we be on this constant sort of uh, round of boosters? I mean, some people have had seven or eight shots at, at this point, which... Um, which I'm thinking that even with the flu shot, you you wouldn't take that many flu shots over the course of two years, right? 
uh, so that's certainly correct. Um, yeah. The it's really really hard to make blanket statements about should everyone. In general, in medicine, if absolute mm -hmm. absolutist statements are always wrong. Should mm -hmm. everyone always get vaccinated always all the time for with every vaccine? Um, probably not. Should no mm -hmm. one ever get vaccinated with no vaccines? Definitely not. Okay. Um, and I think my concern was. I understand why they felt they could not deliver nuanced information to the public because it it, it, it it's just hard to do. Um, but I think you have to try. So I don't know where the cutoff is for who will benefit and who will not, frankly, because it's a new vaccine. Um, my, my personal priority would be if you are over 40, definitely you should be vaccinated. Um, if you have already, if you're COVID recovered, um, there is less uh, benefit to getting mm -hmm. vaccinated. Mm -hmm. If you are under 40, there is less uh, benefit to getting vaccinated. If you have severe medical problems, you should definitely get vaccinated. If you don't, there's less benefit. And the just common basic principles of medicine and ethics, like um, pharmaceutical ads in the States say, talk to your doctor. I think if you're not sure, you deserve to have a doctor that you can talk about this with. And some folks did call me and they mm -hmm. would say, I have heart disease in my family. And I heard that this vaccine causes heart issues. So I don't think I should take it. And I was like, well, what heart disease is in your family? Well, that's not what the, the vaccine causes. And, and what risk factors do you have? And um, some of them elected to take it after that. So what I was really uncomfortable with was on the side of the road, the, there were light up billboards on the 401 that said, get the jab. And I was like, mm. no, that's not, that's not how individual, like health is really complicated and every individual has a rich context. And even as mm -hmm. a physician, if I spend 20 minutes with you, I'm not going to know your whole life, yeah. um, but I hopefully will know enough to come to uh, be able to give you a recommendation. So yeah. um, there are, there are folks who are, Look, we, we have this um, paper that came out in November uh, 2021, where they, they looked at everyone who died suddenly uh, 20 days within a vaccination, and they did autopsies on them. And for they, they had 35 people in at the Heidelberg Medical Center in Baden-Württemberg, Germany, um, which is a province of 11 million people. So they only had 35 who died suddenly. Um, and they, they looked at their hearts, and they found that four of them had myocarditis that couldn't be explained by anything other than the vaccine. Um, so it's not that there's zero risk to this. So mm -hmm. maybe there's a four in 11 million chance of this happening with a vaccination. That's not zero, that's incredibly rare. And I believe that in general at a population level, the vaccine saved way more lives than four out of 11 million. But you have to take people's concerns about that seriously because the number is not zero. Exactly. I mean, it is exactly it is not zero. And uh, yeah, I mean, since you mentioned died suddenly and you probably have um, I don't know if you saw the movie uh, and, and all of the references to died suddenly that have been making the rounds on social media lately, um, you know, it, it, it's you know, I, I, I trained as an economist, so I look for data and hard evidence before I come to some kind of a conclusion when it comes to a certain thing, like what are other factors that could be contributing to a person suddenly collapsing, for example, right? How do you, how do you discern all of the, you know, the, 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 the various um, things at play here? And, and so the conclusion seems to be increasingly by, by you know, uh, by some people that it's the vaccines that are causing these um, heart attacks and, uh, you know, you have these professional athletes who are just uh, collapsing uh, maybe a few weeks after a booster. Some people have died. What exactly is going on here? I mean, is there is there some truth? I mean, uh, and, and here before, you know, before I finish that question, I mean, one of the things that I've learned during the pandemic is that yesterday's conspiracy theory uh, is today's reality. And so I've, um, I'm not quite sure what is going on here. Do the skeptics, the vaccine skeptics have a point here? I think that you are wise to say that you don't know what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. the, the wisest man, uh, in, in, in let's say Western philosophy, Socrates says, I, I only know that I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and on both sides of this issue. So uh, the first thing I'll say is I didn't watch that movie. Yeah. Some people who I think are very thoughtful and reflective who did watch it, 
gave a description to me and I was like, yeah, that, that doesn't sound credible. And it's, it's yeah. not how I'm going to spend two hours on a Friday night. Um, the, what I, what I have seen happening. So like one thing you could take from that German pathology study with the autopsies mm -hmm. is only four out of the 35 people who dropped dead unexpectedly at home um, died because of vaccine induced myocarditis. Okay. And that's not completely confirmed, but it, it seems like the most likely explanation. So I think it's deeply irresponsible if you're on Twitter and somebody faints somewhere or has a heart attack somewhere to say, this is the vaccine. You, they might not even have been vaccinated. So there, there's just a lot of deeply irresponsible claims coming out uh, from anti, like the sort of the old traditional anti-vaccine movement. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think they're in the medical establishment is a reflex of like their conspiracy theorists, their uh, misinformation mongers, uh, they're very bad people, we need to censor them. And no, the vaccine doesn't kill anybody, it's perfectly safe. And it's like, well, no, hang on, absolutism mm -hmm. on both sides. I understand why they're falling into a reflexive absolutism because the claims mm -hmm. made on the anti-vaccine side are, are irresponsible and often false. Yeah. Um, but four out of 35 out of a population of 11 million is still not zero. So we have to be really careful to be nuanced at all times.